Good morning, church. How y'all feeling this morning? Hey, I've got to take a quick picture. Could you just bear with me for just a moment? Those who follow me on Instagram, you'll see why I'm doing this later. But I just kind of, and, and, and listen, if you could for me, just kind of like if you're in my shot, hopefully you don't have a warrant out for you. But if you could smile, like pretend like, you know, you're really into, like this is the best message I've ever heard in my life. And the lights are so bright, I don't know if I got anybody anyway. Well, we had Easter weekend last week, and it was incredible, incredible time together. I hope you enjoyed uh, the whole weekend. What a phenomenal just uh, weekend it was. Um, and we are following up Easter uh, with a mini-series called Why. Today we're going to be talking about why God. And we're talking specifically to God today. Why do you allow suffering? Why is it, God, that you allowed this to happen to me or to my friend? And it's going to be obviously a difficult topic for us to wrestle with, but we're going to do the best job we can today. Amen? And next week we have Pastor Scott will be back in the pulpit, and he will be looking at why church. And we're going to wrestle with some difficult questions as it pertains to the church. Uh, In case you have never really watched 24-hour news before, you may not be aware that The church has uh, some problems with some folks. Some folks have some problems with the church. And for some of it, we really are kind of innocent. And then there's other things we've really done to push folks away. And we're going to look at that. Some of you are here this morning. You were hurt badly at a previous church and you have found healing here. Some of you have been hurt here in our church. And you're still processing going through that healing. Um, But I want you to know next week's going to be uh, phenomenal, and hopefully today's going to be phenomenal as well. I'm going to try my best. Maybe you've heard this before. Maybe you haven't. Um, Jesus healed a lot of people. He opened blind eyes. He made the lame walk. He cured diseases. But every single person Jesus healed went on to die. Let that sink in for a moment. See, suffering and death, pain, They exist in this world. This causes skeptics and believers alike to ask questions like, if God exists, why does he allow evil people to continue doing their dirty deeds? Why does he allow natural disasters to happen? How can cancer and God coexist? Is God unfair? Why does he seem so silent when I need him the most? Where is this justice that he is supposedly so well known for? There's a book by Philip Yancey. It's called Disappointment with God. And uh, he's wrestling with this topic. And uh, he gets a hold of a person who says this statement. He says, I won't believe in a God who allows suffering. Even if he, she, it exists. Maybe God exists. Maybe not. But if he does, he cannot be trusted. Here's one maybe a believer might have thought before. When I am praying for the desire of my heart in a group of two or three, and my faith is the size of a mustard seed, why aren't you hearing me, God? Why are you not answering my prayers? If you've been alive long enough, You've probably found yourself in a place where if you were honest, you have had to wrestle with these questions. Or maybe you were walking life with somebody and you helped them process some of these questions. Maybe you were on the side of a road and you said, why, God? Or maybe it was in a, at a funeral or, or, or maybe it was in a hospital room. And you just simply said, God, why is this happening? Why are you allowing the suffering to take place? Now, if you haven't found yourself in that place before, I want to show you a a quick uh, clip of a a mother who's going to wrestle with God a little bit and simply ask, why did you take my son? Watch this. Father God, I come before you today to ask for your help and your guidance in Brayton's case. Why did 
you let this happen to an innocent child? Where was your mercy? I can't even close my eyes without seeing his last seconds. How alone he must have been. Show me something. Show me something besides what's in my head. Please. Because I can't see past it right now. Show me that you were there with him. Please. Show me something besides what's in my head right now. Maybe you've been there. Where every time you close your eyes, you see the difficulty, the suffering, the tragedy. Did, did you notice the moment when she went from being religious to raw? Did anybody catch that? With her hands folded and saying, dear father. And she found herself at a place where she says, I'm not being honest right now. And she pulls her hands apart and she begins to say, why God? Where was your mercy? A scene like that played out in a chapel of a hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1984. A young man, 18 years old, walked into the chapel, his father a few floors above, actively dying of pancreatic cancer. And began pleading to God, please, God, don't take my dad. Please, God, whatever you do, don't take my dad. I've been told that you can heal. I've been told that you can do anything. I've been told that you can do the supernatural. And I pray right now, and I believe in you, and I trust that you can do this. And probably like some of us that have been there before, he probably made the promises that followed. If you do this, then I'll do that. If you do this, then I'll get involved in church. If you do this, then I'll follow you the rest of my days. A short time after. His father passed away. That was my brother. He was 18 years old. I was six when my father died. All these years later, the question of why directed towards God still exists for my brother. There's a quote by Tim Keller that I think really captures some of this feeling. There may be no greater inner agony than the loss of a relationship we desperately want. Now, we could easily do like four parts on this topic. We could do four weeks in a row on this topic. I'm going to do the very best I can in the next 30 minutes or so to really help us wrestle with this concept of why God allows suffering. I will in no way be able to answer every single question as it pertains to this topic. Um, but I will do my best to help advance the ball in our faith. This Wednesday night uh, at 7 p.m. down in the chapel wing, Dr. Doug, uh, who is just an incredible man of God, just has a great grasp on, on, on Scripture and it does a great job of really breaking it down. Uh, he's going to continue wrestling with this topic. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be plenty of time for you to ask questions and, and learn. Obviously, in a setting like this, I'm doing all the talking, okay? You're not. <laughs> but there's going to be an opportunity for you to ask questions, and so I just encourage you to make it out at 7 o'clock to, to spend some time with uh, Dr. Doug. When people find themselves disappointed with God, does that equal a lack of faith? Sometimes it can feel like we are doing something incredibly wrong by even discussing topics like this in church. Pastor Kevin, we should not be talking about this in church. Somebody could have their faith uh, shaken a little bit. Or you, you, you could cause some significant issues in people's faith. Look, here's the thing, church. Difficulties, trials and tribulation, tragedy is always on the horizon. That's the life that we're living right now. And so it would be better, I think, for us to really wrestle with this. This is what, what, what we used to call apologetics, right? It would be better for us to wrestle with some of this now instead of finding ourselves in the midst of our life in shattered pieces and not knowing what to do. 
The American church loves to preach about a blessed gospel. Americans love prosperity teaching. Name it and claim it. Speak it into existence. Walk in your healing. You're already healed if you believe it. God wants to give you more stuff. Try preaching that to the church in Baghdad, Iraq this morning. You just don't find this kind of teaching in the New Testament. Unless you're looking really, really hard and pulling things way out of context. Now time for God's word. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and throw them up in the air. Come on, let me see those swords. Let's wave them side to side like we just don't care. Everybody else turn your Bibles on. We're going to take a look at the Apostle Paul who experienced lots of suffering in our, on our scripture today. But to do this right, we need to go all the way back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis, we see perfection in the Garden of Eden. We see a naked man and a naked woman hanging out with animals, eating all organic GMO-free food, right? It was awesome. No preservatives. I mean, man, all, those, all the moms in the room would just go nuts, right? It was awesome. And, I, and I, I can't help but wonder, like, what was, what was Adam's experience with the animals? You got to understand something about me. The second I fall asleep, I dream. I'll dream for eight hours, I wake up, and I'm done dreaming. And then my mind just keeps going. I'm just one of those guys, I can't turn my mind off. It's always doing something, okay? So, like, I have two dogs at the house. I have a golden retriever, and I have a, a white uh, Labrador. Uh, I'm always covered with dog hair. If you ever see me, just kind of, you know, do this a couple times, you know. Always, I just, but you know what? I'd rather have dogs and, you know. Not have dog hair on me, I guess. I don't know, whatever. But sometimes I'll take my golden retriever and I'll grab her and I'll fluff her up like a big pillow. I'll put her behind me. I'll put my head on the back, put my arms up like this. I'll watch TV. Anybody ever do that with the, if you got big dogs? Little dogs, I won't make, I won't, I'll, I'll be careful. I won't say anything here. But so I'm not a big dog, right? I wonder, like, in the Garden of Eden, did, animal, did, did Adam go up to the lion and say, come here, bud. Come here, bud. And grab the lion and fluff him up and, like, lay in against him. And the antelope sitting there next to him, like, yeah, baby, this is the lion. And, and, and again, I, I've probably read uh, Chronicles of Narnia too many times, but I wonder, did the animals talk? Okay, they probably didn't. But did the animals talk? Did the, did the duck-billed platypus walk up to Adam and say, hey, man, want we'll to go hang out with the seals today? I don't know. Like, I, I have no idea. But this is where my mind goes. All I know is this. It was perfect. The Garden of Eden was perfect. Until one day we see that perfection cease. Because Adam and Eve do something they were told not to do. See, God created people, not robots. He wanted to experience real love. You cannot force somebody to love you. Now, when I was about 15 years old, there was this girl I was really into, and she wanted nothing to do with me, and I tried to force. It just didn't work, okay? So you, you can, I know by experience, okay? You cannot force somebody to love you. So God said, you can do anything you want, but just don't eat from this tree. Now, in order for real love to exist, it needed an option. People needed a way to say, you know, I really don't love you, or I kind of want to do things my way. I want to choose something else. And once Adam and Eve disobeyed God, everything changed. Sin entered the world. A deep separation took place between God and man, which is what Easter was all about last weekend. I hope you were paying attention. See, suffering exists because of the fall of man. That'll be the first thing we're going to talk about this morning, that suffering exists because of the fall of man. God's walking through the cool of the garden after Adam and Eve have the first sin, and then he talks to them, and then he's getting ready to kick them out of the garden, and he says this in Genesis 3, 16. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains and childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Verse 17. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree, about which I commanded you, you must not eat from. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. I know it's like been in the 30s for the last 17 years, it feels like. It's just so stinking cold all the time. But it's not going to be long before we're out there in our flower beds and out there in, in our vegetable gardens, right? And on those little annoying things are going to start popping up from the soil and all those weeds. And, man, just, just, just that, that's where a lot of that came from. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken... 
For dust you are, and to dust you will return. There's something very significant that's happening here. When sin entered the world, human bodies changed. Death entered the world. The ground changed. Creation changed. And I don't think people really fully understand and appreciate just how much things changed. It wasn't just spiritually, but it was physically things were altered. Sin is the greatest cancer of them all. A, a sinful and, 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 and a sick heart is the reason why a gunman can walk into a school and open fire. It has nothing to do with God's goodness or lack thereof, as some people might accuse. It has nothing to do with him being lazy. It has nothing to do with him not caring. It has everything to do with man's evil, sinful, sick heart. Let me tell you something. God's heart broke for Abel just like it did Parkland, Florida. Sin is what fuels evil. Remove sin and evil cannot exist. What is the first sin we see transpire right after Adam and Eve get kicked out of the garden? We see jealousy and murder. Sin significantly changed things. Let's start moving towards Paul's writing. In Romans chapter 8, 19, we see this. Romans 8, 19. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. Pause. I could spend the rest of the morning right there. Look how Paul viewed suffering. That our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Let's keep going. Verse 19. For the creation waits in eager expectation to, for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up until the present time. So when sin entered the world, it didn't just mess you and I up. It messed up Fido. It messed up the trees. It, it messed up the globe. Like, things changed. Uh, look, look at these words. And these are words that, that it's talking about creation right now, right? Eager expectation for Jesus to return, right? Subject it to frustration. Because man sinned, the rest of the earth had to deal with that frustration, by the will of someone else, again, which was men. But then, of course, we'll see here that we'll be liberated from its bondage. Paul is saying that creation is in bondage. Now, let that sink in for a moment. When Adam and Eve first sinned, what was the first thing to happen? They noticed each other's nakedness, right? And maybe you've seen it in dramas before. You've seen it in human videos. You know, Eve does this number, right? Adam goes, uh, 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 oh, right? There's this... There's this nakedness that takes place that had always been there, but what happened? Their minds changed. Their minds were no longer pure. Their minds were open to things they were never supposed to be open to before. That antelope that was all cozy next to the lion all of a sudden realized, I've got a problem. Because the lion is no longer interested in strawberries, but he wants himself some meat. Things changed. Creation changed. People want to know why there are hurricanes and tsunamis. Go back and look at the fall of man. Study Romans chapter 8. People want to deny that the globe is warming. Now look, I'm not smart enough to know whether it is or not, but I'm biblically literate enough to know that it wouldn't surprise me. Creation is longing for its Savior to return. So suffering exists because of the fall, and, uh, fall of man and the presence of sin. However, God being God takes something as terrible as suffering and shows off his glory in a way that only he can do. Our Redeemer redeems suffering. He makes all things new. Now, let's get more into Paul here. Paul, formerly Saul, uh, was a bad dude. And he was out. Um, he had like this, this purpose in life that he felt that he needed to imprison Christians and put them to death. And that's what he was out and about doing. And he was on his way to put some more Christians to death when God got a hold of him. And from that time on, Paul went through quite a bit of difficulty. He devoted his life 
to the ministry of the Lord. Now, this is where things get interesting. Paul experienced suffering like a millionfold once he began to follow Jesus. There's this misnomer out there that, hey, if you become a Christian, everything's going to be all right. That wasn't the case with Paul. He experienced quite the opposite. Matter of fact, he, he got into it one day. Uh, it, well, he was, he's, he's in his writings, he, he starts bragging about what this, all his suffering is, was about. Now, look, he's not really bragging, but he heard other people bragging about what they had been through. So Paul's like, oh, oh you want to brag? I'll brag. I, that's why I really connect with Paul sometimes because he has this, like, sarcasm thing going on that's like, I get you, dude. I see where you're going with this. I'm picking up what you're putting down. So he says this. He says, okay, check it out. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 24. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. Pause. Anybody afraid of sharks in the room? Anybody afraid of what's below? Here's Paul just chilling, right? In the open sea, day and night. Hope and praying, right? That like to me is like just like whatever, dude. That scares the nonsense out of me. I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles. In other words, in danger from everybody. In danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. If anyone has a reason to ask, why do you allow suffering? It's Paul. He could have easily been like, God, I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to partner with you here. I'm really trying to, like, do the right thing here. I'm, I'm really trying to advance your gospel, and you're allowing all these things to happen. And maybe in your mind... You're thinking, well, me, you know, Paul probably had a relationship with God where he probably really didn't experience much pain. And he, he probably wasn't really, you know, hurting that much. <laughs> Listen to what he says here. Um, 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 11. We do not want you to be uninformed. Okay. Modern day American slang, it'll sound something like this. Look, don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. Brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia, we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to adore, endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. Wow. He's not mincing words there, is he? He's saying it was absolutely horrible what I experienced on behalf of God. It was awful. It was terrible. Like, I, I didn't even know if I want to live anymore, right? That's what he's saying. But then he drops this in there. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. And as you help us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the many prayers. Paul was saying, look, man, don't get it twisted. Listen, listen to what I'm saying here. It was awful what I went through. I've reached my breaking point. Last week, if you read your Bibles and paid attention at Easter weekend, Jesus reached a breaking point too in the garden. He, 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 was, he was praying and he, he starts sweating blood. And he says, God, he says, Father, if you can take this from me, please do so. People like to glance over that moment, but that was a significant moment. He knew the suffering that he was about to experience. You know what I really appreciate about Jesus? Jesus wanted to come uh, be a man and live amongst the people. But in order for him to really do it, he had to experience one thing we all will experience, which is suffering. He experienced suffering. Jesus reached a breaking point. Paul reached a breaking point. But... The interesting part is oftentimes I feel like we don't allow ourselves to reach a breaking point. And I think the reason that is is because we don't want people to think our faith is weak. I think some of us are afraid of what people might think of us. 
I think some of us are afraid that the church might judge us a little bit, or even non-believers might judge us a little bit because, oh, you don't understand why, huh? Hmm. You're not allowed to reach your breaking point. Remember the moment in the clip earlier when the mother pulls her fingers apart and she goes from that religious prayer to that raw prayer? Many people are uncomfortable with that kind of transparency, and so we hide it. Uh, Being in ministry almost 20 years now, I've seen so many people trickle out of the doors because they're afraid to tell people what's really going on in their life. And they harbor anger or bitterness or resentment towards God. And they never process it with other believers. They never process it with a mentor or a pastor or some kind of friend or spiritual leader. And they just kind of sort of trickle out of the church. And let's be honest, there's times where the church doesn't do the best job of receiving that kind of intel. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves but on God. Listen, suffering exists to bring us close to God. Again, we see here our Redeemer redeeming sufferings. Um, As Americans, life can be pretty easy sometimes. We have all the money we need for the most part. Even if you're broke, you have more money than like 90% of the world, okay? We have clean air. We have clean water. We have great schools. Um, We we get all the stuff we want for the most part. We get all kinds of things. Um, Again, even if it doesn't seem like we have a lot, we we, we really, we do. And um, and for the most part, we're, we're very safe. Sometimes I think greater faith is not living in danger every day and believing that God is good. Sometimes I think someone who has everything they need and realizes they are in desperate need of a Savior exhibits even greater faith. Paul showed up, I'm sorry, Paul saw God show up time and time again. My brother hasn't had that luxury yet. And there are certain lessons that can only be learned through difficulty. I know there's a lot of parents in the room, grandparents in the room. And maybe you had conversations like this with your children before. Hi, honey. Okay, listen, I don't think it's a good idea for you to take your favorite toy with you out of the house, okay? You, you, you might lose it, and I know what that would do for you, okay? We don't want to lose your toy. And listen, okay, I know you've already asked me once. I'm telling you we're not going to take your favorite toy out of the house because you could lose it. What's that? You lost your favorite toy? Well, what did daddy and mommy tell you? Don't take your favorite toy out of the house. And when a child begins to experience that type of loss, that kind of pain about something they care about so much, they tend to think twice the next time. Some things can simply be taught, and some people do a better job of just listening. Okay, that makes sense. I'll sign off on that. But some of us need to learn the hard way. Back to what Paul was saying. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. See, the Christian life is all about faith. If we never find ourselves in a position where we really need God, then how will we ever really know God? Paul knew God because Paul was well aware of his need for God. Listen, and you can hear God talking to somebody. You need to get back into church. It's been a while. No, no, listen, you need to get back into a community of believers. Like, you need to do that. I am legitimately, I'm I'm, I'm literally putting people in your path that are inviting you to church. I'm doing every single thing I can that's possible to get you back into the church. I need you amongst believers again. No? What's that? Your marriage is falling apart? Your teenager is wildly out of control and you don't know what to do? That's why I've been trying to tell you to get back in to church. Well, that's cruel. No, it's not. God is more concerned about being in relationship with you and making sure you make it into heaven one day to run into his arms than he is for a little bit of suffering that you may have to encounter. And he will do whatever he has to do to get your attention. How many of you remember driving before Waze and GPS and all that? It's okay. You can raise your hand. Nobody's going to judge you. And you, ha- you actually had to, like, know where to go, right? You, you had to, like, call someone. Okay, so what now? All right, so I'm going right, to, hold on, me. honey, give me a pen, right? And so, okay, so, okay, make a ride on 5th Street, go down the block. Okay, look for the house. There's a crazy lady there. Don't just keep driving. Don't, don't, okay, just keep going. And then make a left here. And then, okay, so uh, your house is purple, right? Oh, no, you painted it? Okay, it's white. Okay, I got it. 
I got it. And, and we didn't have ways and GPS and all this stuff. We just drove, and we'd go somewhere once, and we'd remember how to get back. It was awesome. I feel like the smarter I've gotten, the dumber I've gotten. But you're on your way to work one day, and you pull up to that something that's there, and like, what is this? Why are all the cars stopped right now? And you realize there's a road blockage in your way, and maybe a, a creek came up a little too high, or maybe there was a car accident, and there's something that's got you stopped, and all of a sudden you start seeing cars turn around, right? Cars turn around, and cars turn around. And, and you see a cop saying, go this way, I need you to go this way. And he puts you on this detour, and now you're on a detour, and of course you're thinking, no! I'm going to be late for work, what is this? Because, you know, you always give yourself plenty of time for stuff like this on your way to work. And like, no, and so you, you get all red face and you're all, ah, right? But then, so you're driving, right? Ah, I'm going to be late for work. But then, like, you, you, there's some silver lining. You get a chance to listen to WTOP a little bit more. And there's this really cool story about how, you know, bacon's really not that bad for you. And you're like, oh, that's awesome. I never would have learned that if I didn't go on this detour. Then you're driving a little bit further and you see this building being built. And you're like, it's a good looking building. What is that? God's kids? God's kids preschool? Like, my, my, my wife has been looking for a great place for my kids to go to preschool. This is a brand new preschool. See the silver lining on the detour. And see, sometimes, sometimes God allows roadblocks to take place. One day Paul, then called Saul, was on his way to imprison more Christians. Acts 9, 3 through 9. As he, Paul, entered Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed all around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go to the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They, they heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. And for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Now, I've heard this story um, explained a million times by different pastors and teachers and people. And one of the parts it seems like people don't focus on a whole lot was that whole, for three days he was blind and didn't eat and he didn't drink. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us, I'm going to make you blind for three days. It doesn't say that. It just says he was blind for three days. Three days in total darkness, three days of absolute suffering, wondering, will I get my eyesight back? He didn't know. For three days, for three days he suffered. And it was in that suffering that God changed his direction. Growing up without a father is one of the most difficult things I think that can happen to someone in life. Um, there's a lot of things that you don't think about the fathers just kind of do for their sons. I, I, I'm a big believer that there are certain things only men can teach their children. And there are certain things only mothers can teach their children. I'm just a firm believer in that. And without having a, a father, there's all these things that just kind of happen in life, right? My mom tried to teach me how to shave, but it was pretty bad. <laughs> Faces are different than legs. That's all I can say. Um, but even like, you know, learning how to shake a man's hand and look him in the eye and how, how tight, and how firm to hold another man's hand when you greet him. Or when that girl in eighth grade starts thinking you're cute or you start thinking she's cute and what do I do with that? What do I do with those feelings? Not having a father around was tough. It was difficult. I remember playing baseball as a kid and I'd show up and I'd see you know, all these fathers throwing a ball with their sons. I didn't have anybody to teach me that, you know, you step into it when you throw and release here. I didn't have that. I just had to learn it all on my own. And I remember the pain that I would see when I'd see all these young boys with dad. And he'd be like, come on, son, let's go, let's go to Denny's after practice or something. And I'd think, I don't have that. And I was always, I always felt out of place because then I'd see, I'd be sitting there holding my glove, you know. And then the dad was, hey, come join us, buddy. Come join us. We'll, we'll, we'll throw a little pyramid here or something, you know. And it's the triangle. And it's just like, okay. I'll be the odd man out, and thanks for showing me mercy. And there was deep feelings of, God, why did you take my father from me? And for years I went through this. For years I questioned God, who are you to take my dad from me? What kind of cruel God takes a young boy's father from him? But as I got older, the Lord really began to reveal some things to me. 
And when it comes to my father dying, there were two things that stick out to me. One is this. When he got pancreatic cancer, it was a death sentence, especially back in 1984. My dad wanted nothing to do with God whatsoever. Matter of fact, he would actually tear up some of the Bibles in the house. About a month before he died, he's lying on his deathbed and he tells my mom, call your pastor in. And in that moment, he tells the pastor, with whatever time I have left, I want to live for God. See, I don't know that my dad ever would have gave his life to Jesus had he not been in a place where he was forced to look up. The other thing is this, had he, had, he, had he never gotten sick and he'd never passed, I would have grown up in Northeast Philadelphia. I, I'm pretty sure I probably wouldn't have found Jesus. I don't know for sure, but I know that it would have been an incredibly different life. And when I moved to South Florida and, I, and God began to place me around some folks that began to love me and, and show me the ways of Jesus and thank God for Sunday school teachers and thank God for children's pastors that continue to show me the way um, my father's death was that roadblock, that detour that God said, I, I need you to go this way. And it was because of that that I've been able to preach to thousands of teenagers and adults in the past almost 20 years. Under the ministry, under my ministry, God has got teenagers all across the world serving as missionaries and Christian businessmen and, 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 and Christian, uh, you, you name it, in the business world. And I got teenagers now, they're in their 30s that are having healthy marriages. And they all because there was this moment where God said, I'm going to take your dad from you. And I reached a point in my life where I realized my father had to die in order for my life to be on the right path. Paul wouldn't have written most of the New Testament had he not had those three dark days of suffering. Okay, so suffering exists because of the fall of man. God redeems suffering to bring us close to him and so that he can force us to change directions when needed. Check, check, check. I'm with you. I can buy that. That makes sense. But what about the times when we don't see God's glory? What about the people who die without ever seeing the purpose of the suffering that they went through? What about the times when the suffering is so bad, the injustice is so bad, that it just doesn't make any kind of sense? That brings me to my fourth thing, and we'll close in just a moment. Suffering exists because, well, we won't always know. And this is where faith kicks in. Well, if you don't have the answer, then maybe God really doesn't exist. No, uh-uh. That's not how it works. See, God has revealed himself to me so many times as I've abided in him, as I've tried to draw closer to him. He's revealed himself to me time and time again. And to steal a phrase from Pastor Scott, I don't know if he's ever said it up here, but he said it to us in staff meetings before. He'll say something like this, I may not have all the answers, but this is what I do know. This is what I know. And let me tell you something, when it comes to me and my life, this is what I know. I know that I was a drug addict. I know that I was a drunk. I know that I drove drunk seven nights a week. I know that my life was spiraling out of control, that I was on my way to kill myself or kill someone else. And let me tell you something. I needed, when I came to the cross, I needed significant drug rehab in my life. And God said, you know, I don't need you to go anywhere. I'm going to give you supernatural drug rehab. And let me tell you something. For some reason, some crazy reason, I put down a pack of zigzags and a pipe and picked up a Bible and a microphone, and I don't know why God chose to use me, and I don't have all the answers to suffering, but this is what I do know. God has done a miracle in my life. My wife and I, married 10 years, weren't able to have a child 10 years in. Dude, not only did I not have a father to throw a baseball to me as a kid, now I don't have a son or a daughter to throw a baseball to. This is what I know. 10 years in, my wife walks in and says, I'm pregnant and hands me a, a, a positive pregnancy test and we get all excited and we're crying and it's awesome. But listen to this. About seven days later, she comes and says, I don't mean to bother you, but I'm showing some signs that I'm really concerned about. And we went to the emergency room and we, and we saw three different doctors over the course of the next week that said, you need to be ready for a miscarriage. 
okay? We even had our primary, uh, not our primary doctor, our, the, uh, what do you call the OBGYN, whatever. That's the first time I ever said that in church. We even had th- th- this person say, hey, we need you to uh, come in and we're going to schedule a DNC. But something didn't work inside of me. That Something wasn't functioning. Someone was like, no, that's, that's not it. That's not the end of the story. And, and let me tell you something. That was my daughter, Julia, who I dropped off at Sunday school this morning. I don't have all the answers, but God has revealed himself to me in ways that I can't possibly imagine. I've seen the supernatural time and time. God has used my voice to command demons to come out of a possessed person. God has used my hands to put them on a sick person and, and, and see supernatural healing transpire. I don't know why God allows some of the suffering that he does, but I know he exists and I know he loves and I know he cares. There's been so many times financially we couldn't make it. We didn't know how we were going to make it. We were short. And I go to the, the mailbox and there's a check for the exact amount that we needed. God has revealed himself to me so many times. Listen to me, I don't have the right education and, and, and I probably use de- double negatives way too much. And, 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 and here's the thing, I didn't go to the right school and, and I don't come from good stock. But for some reason, God decided to use me as I said, I'll follow you and go where you take me. I don't have all the answers this morning, but I do know this. I know that God loves each and every one more than we could ever possibly imagine, that I would never question his existence after the way he has proved himself to me time and again. As I have abided in Jesus, as I've gotten to know Jesus, as I said, I said, here's my life, take it all. He has revealed himself to me in ways that have cemented his existence in my life. God is mysterious. His ways won't always make sense to us. Suffering exists, but it pales in comparison to the might, wisdom, and mercy of our God. If I could have you all across this room, just close your eyes for a moment. Take us home. Suffering is going to happen. And when it does, we can do one of two things. We either run towards God or away from him. We can pray.